Hey everybody, welcome back to Fix Dish. And I have a first for me on an industrial battery. As you can kind of see there, there's not really an inner cell connector. Don't have to be a battery expert to know that, well, it has to be connected in the middle somehow. So let's get into it and see what happens. Maintenance department must not be on the up and up. That's a Bluetooth battery. Not a doctor here, but I'd say Pfizer might be able to help out with these lead inner cell connectors. Uh, anyways, you can see they got very hot. They're a little uh, saggy there in the middle. But uh, the cables look brand new, and someone recently put them on. Just for testing purposes, I wanted to make sure the battery was you know, still usable, so I crudely welded one back in. I've always saved various lengths of inner cell connectors, not knowing why, but that kind of paid off here for me. And these are all the caps. I had to basically peel them off of every one, and they're just freaking melted. And now I have a whole box of inner cell connectors, cap covers, and lead bars to weld that all together. Might have a little too many lead bars to do the welding, but I have enough now. Interestingly, the crossover cable here looks fine, not melted, and looks in relatively good condition. If you watched some of my other battery videos before, you've seen me cut apart some of these inner cell connectors uh, to prepare swapping out uh, bad cells with new cells. Uh, I'm not doing that today, but I have to replace all the inner cell connectors. So I'll be drilling out every single one of these bars, replacing them all, and rewelding them all back in. So as I started drilling this, it kind of dawns on me. I wonder if these new inner cell connectors are the same size as this bit, and are the inner cell connectors the same size as the old ones? You always want to check the stuff before you get too crazy, because I mean, can you imagine drilling all these out and then realize you have the wrong inner cell connectors? So yeah, definitely want to make sure you have the right parts before you begin, and make sure that they fit appropriately. The point of this video is not going to be to sit here and weld up this entire battery and have you watch me do this. I want to get into the science of the battery uh, once I have repaired it. But I just kind of wanted to show you that I had to replace all of these inner cell connectors before we got to that point. After I get the inner cell connector off, I take the bit back over top of the lug and I just clean it up all the way down to uh, the rubber grommet. And that way the new cell sits down all the way and it has a lot nicer finish to it. So I'm gonna start by buzzing off the top of these old cells. Uh, there's a little bit of oxidation on the lead. I just wanna make sure that it's nice and clean when I go to uh, weld them back in. So if you've never seen this before, this is stick welding for batteries. Uh, you're using a stinger to hold the rods, which are carbon arc rods. Uh, a length of wire, this is one aught wire with like a jumper cable on the end. And you will link a few cells together in order to arc to the cell that you're trying to weld up. I'm reasonably sure you can buy these in kits. Uh, we just made these. Uh, we bought a jumper cable end, uh, had a piece of one not cable left over from a battery and then bought a stick welding stinger. And then what we're using is a eighth inch carbon arc rods. Now each cell is two volts. Uh, typically it is enough to have six to eight volts to do your welding. It will get plenty of a pool. It is bright. So you do want to wear like a shaded mask. As you can see, it's red hot there on the end. And then as you melt down that original uh, parent stud or that parent metal, uh, you want to bond it into the new inner cell connector as best you can, and then start adding lead back in once you know you have a good bond. Uh, you're trying to make it as much of one piece as you can. So you're probably asking yourself, how did this happen? Well, the battery cables are basically brand new and you could tell they're recently welded in. So somebody had tried to repair this. But my guess is when they tried to charge it and noticed it wouldn't take a charge that they thought something else had happened. Um, I myself didn't notice until I pulled the inner cell connector caps off and seeing one of them had melted through. And I went ahead and welded in temporarily a inner cell connector and then attempted to charge it to make sure there was no other issues with the battery. And once I had verified there was no other issues, I went ahead and decided to replace all the inner cell connectors 
and uh, try to recover this battery. So right here, it's gonna look like I'm having trouble getting this started. And that's because the bar or the inner cell connector is what's carrying the current from the previous cell. And I'm trying to get the parent stud of the new cell to start flowing. Well, I have to basically short the two together because I want to melt not the inner cell connector, but the stud down. And there's a little bit of an air gap around there. So this is the inner cell connector. And this is what I'm calling the parent metal or the post. And this is what I'm trying to melt down first. I don't want to necessarily melt the inner cell connector. I want to melt the post to the inner cell connector. And uh, I'm going to shade it down so it's a little easier to see. It's a little bit of contamination that got in there. I'm trying to flick it out of there. But you can kind of see how uh, when I pull that rod away that there's a pool of liquid lead in the middle. It's a little easier to see on this one, but as I'm melting down that post, uh, you can see that I'm angling the stick towards the walls of the inner cell connector. Uh, you don't want to melt through the inner cell connector because you'll lose your pool. It'll basically flow outside of it. But I'm trying to melt into the side of the inner cell connector to make sure I have a nice bond all the way through. So this part I didn't have to do, but you know, I feel for the next guy that might have to work on this battery and I've been that next guy and it sucks when that information's not there. So I transferred her over from the old inner cell connector. You can see how hard that was to read, but I transferred it over and now I'm going to weld that back into place. Thanks again for following me along. Make sure you subscribe so you can see all my content and uh, throw a comment down there. Let me know what you think of this whole process. And if you find this interesting, Share it with your friends and don't forget to like the video. Now check that out. What a difference from a melted inner cell connector to looking brand spanking new. All right, now into part two of this video. Let's get into the revival of this battery and let's see what we can do to figure out what was wrong with it, if anything at all. So I'm hooking this up to our stable mate, which is a timed charger with a twist. It is constant current, 50 amps per cell, no matter how many cells, it will do anywhere from one to 24 cells. But the caveat here is you have to be careful what you plug it into because 50 amps could be too big for a battery. You want to stay within 10% of the total capacity of the battery. Otherwise, you could burn something up pretty easy. Uh, so here we are starting with our 24 volt battery. And the way you know it's 24 volts is uh, you've got 12 individual cells. 2 volts times 12 cells is 24 volts. So this is a 24 volt battery. We're going to go ahead and prepare our battery discharge test. Uh, we're going to be load banking this battery to figure out the capacity of it. So we'll have to start with the baseline. This unit was charged and then constant currented. So in its current state, it is as topped off as it's going to get. We also verify that we have electrolyte or water in here. And we're going to take samples of it before we start. We'll check pre and post. So we'll start filling this battery out. I didn't used to fill these sheets out in their entirety. Uh, over time, I have started doing that. Better documentation, easier to uh, go over because you don't have to remember anything. It's just all written down in the sheet. So I highly encourage when you do set one of these up that you fill it out in its entirety. The only thing that's affected by temperature is the gravity. So we'll want to check our uh, current starting temperature. So when we take gravities, we know that if we need to add or subtract a few points to have an accurate reading of what the gravity is. Uh, our overall surface temperature is approximately 100 degrees, depending on where you check it at. Um, and then our ambient temperature, about 72. So uh, this is still recovering off of uh, last night's charge, but we're more concerned about the internal temperature. So I checked some of the more centers cells and I'll get a reading inside of it and we're looking at about 130 degrees on the potentially yeah about 130 degrees it's a bit hot to be load banking this right now now that the fan's been blowing across us for a while we're under 100 degrees I don't take samples over 110 degrees due to the fact that there's temperature correction you have to do on voltages to make it accurate 
So in some previous videos in the comments, there was a question about the difference between re refractometers and hydrometers. Refractometers are more precise with minimal sample requirements and have a distinct advantage over hydrometer. They are not susceptible to temperature uh, variation and impurities. This is largely due to the limited sample being used in a refractometer versus the hydrometer, which is a significant more volume of fluid being tested. I've used both. Hydrometers are faster for checking gravity and batteries. However, the refractometer, in my opinion, especially since I do acid adjustments, I also prefer the refractometer that I don't have to do any temperature corrections. Since it's such a small sample of water, uh, it assumes the temperature of the thing you put it on relatively quickly, so you don't have to do any adjustments. Now here we're taking a look at the sample uh, after my calibration, and trying to get lined up there. And you can see on the upper left here, we're at uh, 1290 gravity, 1295 gravity. The manufacturer spec on this battery is 1280 for the gravity. So we can see we're above it by a little bit. And as a general rule of thumb, every 35 points you are above the specified gravity amount, you can reduce the life of the battery by half. And that's due to the excessive slough off of the positive plate that occurs with the higher gravity. Now to give you some context, every 25 points of gravity is usually about an hour of runtime in the field, depending on the use, of course. So for every 25 points of gravity that the battery is low, you lose about an hour runtime potentially. Now you might be asking yourself, what's the point of doing the gravity when I can check voltage? Voltage is kind of misleading. Now there is a relationship of open circuit voltage to specific gravity. Um, every one one hundredth of a volt is approximately 10 points of specific gravity. Now this is assuming that all surface charge has been dissipated from the battery. So like if it's been sitting for 24 hours, no charging or anything like that, or no recent usage, you could use that uh, relative conversion. Um, I'm going to post a chart up here that is usable to kind of give you context of open circuit voltage to gravity. It is relatively accurate. I have tested myself with uh, accuracy within hundredths of a point, which is definitely close enough for me. Many of times, though, you're walking into a customer site, you don't know what the status of the battery is. So the go to is always to check gravity uh, that that doesn't lie to you or the voltage can. So if you're using a hydrometer, which is perfectly fine, uh, I also have a chart I'm going to post up here that will give you the amount of adjustment you'll have to do uh, for temperature. Basically, if, as long as you're under 110 degrees, I don't do any adjustments. It's so small, it doesn't matter. But anything over 110 degrees internal temperature, it actually ends up being hundreds of a point and does affect your uh, accuracy of the gravity and voltage. So while doing some of this testing, I came across a cell that had some excessive positive plate shedding. And this right here is the result of that. You can see the darkening of the fluid. Uh, with using the refractometer, it doesn't uh, change the overall density of the fluid. It just kind of changes the color of it. Um, and then same thing for the uh, hydrometer. Even though it's discolored like that, the it doesn't affect what the readout is. Uh, but some of that contamination, if it builds up in the hydrometer, can affect how the float works, it may stick, it may not uh, freely uh, bob inside the fluid. And another uh, problem with hydrometers is when you pull up a sample of water, you may not be pulling up the same amount of water in the hydrometer every single time. And the amount you pull up in can affect the overall average density, because if you were to pull up additional slough uh, when it gets closer to the plate versus if one is an overly full cell, one may be more dense than another, depending on the contaminants that are in the water. So you may pull several samples from the same exact cell with the hydrometer and may end up with three different tests. Uh, and again, temperature matters on those. So you'll want to do correction for temperature. And that's assuming that you're trying to do like a hydrometer versus refractometer uh, test. But yeah, again, this is another reason I go with the refractometer versus the hydrometer. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and start our load bank now. And uh, you can see how I've got it all rigged up here. And we're gonna go off of our chart, which we are operating on 24 volts. And this is a 600 amp hour battery. 600 amp hour battery. It's rated for six hours of continuous use. So six divided by 600, or 600 divided by six, that's 100 amps. So we need to be able to pull 100 amps, which is basically 
we're going to flip both switches four and five to get a 100 amp load. And then this one right here is from uh, zero to 12. That's this variable one. We're going to have him on because as we start to drain the battery, it's going to drop under 100, which we'll be able to verify here. So we're going to flip our fan on. It's going to keep the coil cool. And then we're going to go ahead and flip on, like we said, our uh, four and five. That brings us up to our, well, it should be a 100 amp load, but we're going to flip on one, but you can see it changed nothing, but we'll hand roll this up until we're at 100. And then we're going to go ahead and keep track hour by hour and record where our voltage is dropped to. So on that one right there, we were 2.0 volts per cell in the first hour. 96, 96, so cell 8 dropped to 1.94. So cell number 8 dropped, uh, it dropped to 1.94, otherwise I'm 1.96 through here and 1.96 through here. So here's the end result of the test. Um, as you see in the video, I didn't record this down. I had to go back and watch the video to see what it was. I tested it, but I just didn't write it down for whatever reason. Anyway, so as I went through uh, in the first hour, we had 2.0 volt all the way down. Second hour, uh, 1.96 all the way through, except on cell number eight. It started to drop a little bit more, a couple, ten, uh, a couple hundredths more than the rest. And then this is where I figured out I wasn't writing down my 12th cell. So I went back and fixed it. So anyways, as you can see, consistently uh, 190s all the way down, except for this one, uh, uh, 188. In this fourth hour of testing, 186 all the way down. This is 183. Fifth hour of testing, 182 all the way down, 180. And uh, you don't run them more than any, six, any more than six hours or anything under uh, 1.70 volts. You'll terminate the te uh, test on any of those cells. Anyways, this battery is four years old, and despite it having the accident that it did, it was clearly going to go into the sixth hour. Uh, so I called this battery good and uh, able to be put back into service. So I terminated the test, uh, let it cool down completely, and then put it back on a charger, charged it back up fully, and sent it back onto the customer. So anyways, this battery is good to go, despite the incident that it had. And it kind of goes to show that you can dead short them out like that. And these industrial batteries are pretty tough. And a lot of people would have condemned this battery into buying a new one. Uh, ended up saving the customer uh, probably about $4,000 uh, from having to buy a whole new battery. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, hopefully this information takes a little bit of the uh, magic out of not knowing the difference between gravity, cell voltage. Uh, and then those of you who are into some of the battery testing... Hopefully this uh, unlocks some of the mystery that comes with batteries and maybe some of the differences with testing equipment. If you guys have questions, please post it down below. I would be interested in hear your versions of doing battery testing or if you see any flaws in uh, some of my testing procedures. Um, but yeah, I've really enjoyed doing these battery videos with you guys and uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks again and we'll see you guys next time on Fix-ish.